So I want to say welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out to my talk um, on improving a distributed system post-incident. Going to give um, a real-life experience of working on a software system at my job at DigitalOcean. Um, if at any point you have trouble hearing me or anything, please drop a note in the chat. And also at any point, if you have a question, um, you can drop it in the chat or Q&A, and I will answer all the questions at the end of the talk. Um, but without further ado, let's get started. So um, just to give a little background on me, my name is Julia Zurich, um, frequent tech and talk uh, presenter. And um, for those of you who maybe haven't, uh, don't know me, um, I'm a launch school grad who did launch school from 2017 to 2019. Um, I did capstone at the end of 2018, and I was part of the team that built spacecraft. Um, since uh, graduating from Capstone, um, I moved to New York and I um, landed a job at DigitalOcean, at which I've been working for almost 11 months now. And um, the work that I do at DigitalOcean is around the area of software-defined networking, or SDN. And the best way that I can describe what it is, is basically mm, the team that I'm a part of helps shepherd network packets around our system. So basically making sure that our customers and their requests go to the right service in our uh, software system and all those kinds of things. Um, but more specifically, the uh, service, the small piece of our system that my team works on is our IP address management system, also known as IPAM. And I'm gonna go into more detail about all of this um, throughout this talk, but I just wanna give a little overhead right now. Um, and since joining DigitalOcean, most of my work has been in the Go uh, language, um, which is very different from Ruby or JavaScript, but quite easy to pick up after law school. And uh, my work involves handling distributed systems. And IPAM is one small component of the overall software system at DigitalOcean. So with that said, um, I'm, before I go into the incident that prefaced this, uh, that created this whole talk, um, I want to give a little bit of a background of DigitalOcean and kind of how uh, the product the products at DigitalOcean can, um, are part of this incident that I'm going to talk about. So DigitalOcean, our main product that we offer customers is something called a droplet. And a droplet is basically just a virtual machine, which you can think of as a virtualized computer, and it can run small programs or all the way up to large applications. Basically, DigitalOcean's business is that it buys servers and then using a, um, some software, it can create small virtual machines running on each server and then let customers use those virtual machines to run their programs and their applications. Um, some people use these to host their blog or their personal website and then other businesses run their entire uh, system on uh, droplets. So it's the main product of DigitalOcean. Um, there are single droplets, which are small workspaces that can be used by playgrounds, by developers wanting to learn um, web development and such, for people to host their blogs, static sites and such. We also have specialized versions of droplets, which have um, extensive memory or CPU capabilities for specialized work. You know, some of our customers are trying to do some work that requires a ton of processing, so they want some droplets with more CPU power, others need more memory, and so forth. And, you know, like I said, some companies create hundreds of droplets at a time for data processing, whereas other businesses use droplets to build their entire uh, software infrastructure um, to run their business. So uh, business is booming, and we have a lot of customers with a lot of needs um, for our product. And to kind of give you an idea of what a virtual machine is, it's kind of just what I was talking about before. On the left here, we have the typical um, mental model of what's going on when you're running programs on your own computer, your own laptop. You have some hardware that has CPU, RAM, disk, input and output, and has an operating system running the whole computer and everything. And you have your app that is running on your computer. You can have several apps running on the same computer, but the general idea is just you have your computer, its operating system, its various resources of CPU, RAM, and such, and your application running. But on the right, you have a situation of what we have here at DigitalOcean. Um, on a um, hardware, like a server, there's some software that is called a hypervisor, and that software 
can um, very intelligently take all of the uh, CPU, RAM, and resources on the machine and chop it up into smaller pieces and kind of virtualize that hardware and then encapsulate it. And then each of them is isolated. And that is what users use to run their applications. So anytime a customer comes to DigitalOcean and requests a droplet, there's actually a server at one of our data centers, which creates a small virtual machine. So just a tiny virtualized computer in um, running on it that has its own CPU, its own RAM and everything. And that is what the customer runs their application on. And so this is just a high level picture. You won't really need to know all these details for the incident that I'm going to talk about, but this is just to give you an overhead of what exactly we're talking about with virtual machines and droplets. There can be many virtual machines on a single hardware, um, such as a server. And so, when we come to having all these droplets and we have to talk about networking, because at the end of the day, we have all these droplets that are running on some hardware, but we also need to make sure that the customer can send the right requests, the right network traffic to the right droplet. And so typically um, when you have various computers um, hosting web content or running applications on the internet, the way they communicate with users is over the network, by sending network packets. There's um, a whole course of this at Launch School now called 170, I believe, which is the networking course, which goes in depth about networks and sending packets and everything. But the idea is just that there's a path from the user to the machine where information is delivered and then delivered back. With, and you can see that down here in this kind of diagram here, we have the user on the left, they're wanting to access some backend server. They send their traffic. It could go to all kinds of different pieces of a system, a load balancer, application server, database server, and all of which is part of the system and it goes back to them. Now, that's the case of computers on the internet. With virtual machines, there is some more complexity because when you have many virtual machines in a computer, you need to be able to take network packets sent to that computer and direct it to the correct virtual machine. So there can be many virtual machines on the same computer. How do you make sure that the right packet goes to the right virtual machine? Like I said, DigitalOcean has many servers and on each server there's many virtual machines. So if you have two customers having a droplet each on the same machine, you wanna make sure the right network traffic, the right user request goes to the correct droplet. And that's kind of where software defined networking comes in, which is the team that I'm a part of. So our goal is to make sure that the right network traffic goes to the right virtual machine, to the right droplet. Um, and that's basically what we do. And so that, is where we come in with IPAM, which is the IP address management service. And this really answers part of the question of how do we direct network traffic to each droplet? Well, we kind of do it just like we would with uh, any other um, computer on the internet. We give it an IP address. Um, and once again, IP addresses and such are talked about in depth in the Launch School networking course. Um, every um, device on the internet has an IP address which uniquely identifies its location so that the right network traffic goes to it. So once you have the IP address of your destination, you can send network traffic to it over the internet. Well, the same thing with droplets at DigitalOcean. We give every droplet its own IP address so that helps direct the correct traffic to the right droplet. And so the IP address management service is the service at DO which assigns and manages every single IP address to every droplet at DigitalOcean. To give you an idea of how massive the scale is, we currently have 4.2 million actively assigned IP addresses at DigitalOcean. And every day we're handling around 390,000 IP addresses being assigned or unassigned or moved about every day. And this is all being done on a team of just four engineers. So it's a pretty critical piece of software in our system. And it's kind of directly in line with what our customers most want to get a droplet. And so here's just a brief overview of the architecture. 
at DO for kind of how this might look. This is not the whole picture. There's a lot more pieces in our system. But typically, if you want to create a droplet and use it, this is how it goes. A user on the last sends a request, which could be through the DigitalOcean um, user interface. We also have a command line tool that does it as well. They send a request for a droplet saying, I would like to get a droplet so that I can do whatever I want with it. That request goes to our public API, which then sends that request to Harpoon. And Harpoon is a separate service with a separate team. And their whole job is just to take these requests from users and send it the right way. And in this case, if they want to create a droplet, they're making sure that this create request gets fulfilled. And they send it to us at IPAM. They also send part of the info to this other service called Orca, which we don't really need to talk too much about. It was just in the diagram here that I pulled from DigitalOcean. But you know, the Harpoon is told, I want a droplet created. And they say, okay, IPAM, we need an IP address for this droplet. And so IPAM then talks directly to Alpha, which is the database here at DigitalOcean. And Alpha is a huge database. Um, and actually behind the scenes, we have several smaller, well, not smaller, but we have several replications of Alpha just to serve as uh, backups in case one falls over, one crashes to also, um, duplicate our data in case you know, some critical issue happens and we don't want to lose our customer data. So that's why we have little replicas on the right here. But generally the flow is user sends a request to create a droplet, that request goes to Harpoon, Harpoon talks to IPAM, IPAM talks to Alpha the database saying, okay, we're going to pick this IP, we're going to say it is now assigned to this droplet. Alpha says, okay, we have that, we have that completed. IPAM talks back to Harpoon and says, this is done. And Harpoon talks back to the user through the API and says, okay, your droplet is created. Here's its IP address. Go ahead and connect to it and um, install your applications and just do whatever you want to do. So that's the overall architecture. And I wanted to lay that out so that you can kind of have an idea of the big picture once we talk about this incident. So uh, with these larger systems um, or critical software, um, we typically have something which is the on-call rotation. And this on-call rotation is typically done using an app called PagerDuty. And so at DigitalOcean, after onboarding to the company and getting some time to learn the system, engineers are added to the on-call rotation. And basically what that means is that when you are scheduled to be on call, you are able to be paged through this app on your phone at any time for if the system goes down or there's major issues and you need to hop on and help fix the problem. This can be at any time of day um, and it is uh, typically about a week that any engineer is on the schedule. Now each team manages their own service and the members of that team rotate holding the pager. So it's only for your own small piece of the system that you are accountable for while you are on call. If the service goes down or starts underperforming, you can get paged in to fix the service. And uh, yeah, that's basically what it is. Um, now, a caveat though, is that if another piece of our system starts failing and the team responding suspects it might actually be a cause of another service, that other team for that service can get paged in. So you can see how a big issue in the system can lead to many teams being paged in to address it. And so typically this is something that is part of the experience of working at a larger tech company or if you work on critical systems, but it's not part of every software engineering job. If you work at a web development shop or um, SaaS solutions or you're creating custom applications for clients, you might not be on call per se. But if you're working in a larger tech company, it's typically a part of your life as a software engineer. So with all that being said, we'll dive right in. So the incident I'm going to talk about is one of the first ones that I dealt with since joining DigitalOcean. And it all started at getting a page at 4 a.m. Um, so basically the scene is, is that I was on call um, for a week and on the very last night of my rotation, I was paged at 4 a.m. to address um, an issue with the system. And the situation was that um, 
the software system could not create droplets. Any request to create a droplet was lagging and then erroring out. So in other words, we were having lots of users who were trying to access the DigitalOcean website and create droplets, and our system couldn't complete their request. Users were getting server errors saying, can't do this right now. The first team to respond was Harpoon, which is, as I said, the team that handles all the creation um, events from the API. But when they looked at their service, they found that they were fine. They didn't have any issues right with them. They determined that the real issue was IPAM, which couldn't finish allocating an IP address for every new droplet to be created. Harpoon was sending the request to us, but we couldn't finish the request. So that's when I got paged in. And bleary eyed and stumbling up, um, I proceeded to begin investigations and started trying to see what was going on by using our monitoring tools, which we'll look at more closely soon. Basically, these tools allow us to create graphs and charts to see what is going on with the internals of our system with every request that is coming in and every response. And I was able to see that IPAM was experiencing very high latencies in completing requests to allocate an IP. And so just to give um, you know, definition, latency is the time while waiting. So it's the time between sending a request and getting a response. From the time that you are trying to access something and you're waiting for the spinning dial to load on your computer and then getting the response, that's latency. Now, usually for IPAM, the latency for allocating an IP was 40 milliseconds to two seconds, which is pretty quick. But for this situation, we were seeing latencies of upwards of 30 seconds or more, which is way out of line. These high latencies were eventually causing a 100% error rate for allocating IPs. So what that means is that for periods of time, no customer could create a droplet, which meant that we were basically getting no traffic and no revenue for that period of time, which is pretty concerning. And so here's one of those charts. This is using a service called Grafana. And you can see that this is basically the chart of the latencies for requests for this uh, endpoint for allocating an IP. And you can see that, you know, two seconds up to maybe five seconds, once peaking over six seconds. There's other charts during the day that would say 40 milliseconds, it really depends. But this is typical. But what we were, we were seeing was something more like this, where you can see the green in this case is the allocating IPs and it's upwards of above 30 seconds. And it's just staying there constantly for hours. And this was, this was a terrible situation. So when you have these long latencies and things don't get completed, you have just increasing error rates for that, uh, that service, creating and allocating that IP. And you can see this right here in these green spikes where you see error rates of 100% several times. And even when it's not, it's pretty high. So all of our monitoring, our services to see what was going on was showing us that we were in big trouble. And so we were trying to figure out what is the issue? And after just looking around and trying to figure things out and diving into the code a bit, we found that the issue was actually something mentioned by one of the engineers of Harpoon, the team handling the creates. And they recalled that there was something like this that had happened before. And they suggested that we look at the isolation level of our database operations. And after diving into our code, we found that IPAM ran database operations at the level of repeatable read instead of read committed. And what that kind of means is that when you have a service talking to a database and trying to perform operations, trying to grab data, trying to update data, doing inserts and that kind of stuff, there's basically four levels at which you can run that operation. And each level has a trade-off. Some of them are very high performance, like read committed, but has a very uh, low security. And then if you go all the way to the right here, you have serializable, which is a high isolation level, which is very secure, but has terribly low performance. And what we mean by security is basically this concept that when you are performing a database operation, you are safe from another operation coming in and causing an issue. This is important when you have a big system like DO, where there can be hundreds of thousands of millions of operations going at the same time, and you want to make sure that when you're doing something, 
another operation doesn't come and mess your operation up. So the end point is that we were operating at this third level repeatable read, which didn't have great performance, but was secure. But the engineer suggested we try read committed, which would give us a better performance, maybe let us resolve our operations faster and lower our latency, but we were worried, is it secure enough? If you want more info on these isolation levels, there's a link here, then I'll show these slides after the talk and you can read more about it. But this is just the general idea is that there was a change we had to make in our code to fix the issue. And so the question was, oh, it's just a quick patch, right? The Harpoon team suggested that we patch our code to change the isolation level. But the issue is, is that database operations are a critical piece of IPAM. And we're dealing with IPs going to the right droplet. You want to make sure that the whole operation is safe, secure, it happens correctly, um, and there's no issues. And we were concerned that, you know, if we just do this quick fix and submit it, sure, we could fix the incident going on right now. But what happens if the thing that we fixed actually caused issues later on that we didn't expect? Um, and that's something that we wanted to be very careful about. And so we pushed back on the team and said, you know, unless we have time to test, we're not going to patch it. We have to make sure that what we're doing is correct and it's not going to cause further issues. No tests, no patch. And so the rest of the day, from when I woke up at 4 a.m. until basically 8 or 9 p.m. that day, um, the, myself and the rest of my team worked on testing our patch, checking to see if there were any issues, and making sure that it was the correct thing to do without making the situation worse. And actually, we found that at the end of the day that everything looked fine. We ran a bunch of different kinds of tests and found that the patch was safe. We ran load tests, which is essentially the idea of you're testing the, the system with a high amount of requests for a period of time, just making sure that it handles that high amount of requests for a long period of time. We did volume tests, which basically said, we're going to send as many requests as we can and just see if you can handle it. And it seemed fine. And then we did correctness tests. We were basically um, ran the database operation and made sure that what we expected to happen, happened. So just making sure that it was uh, meeting our hypothesis. So generally, we just would try to be very thorough in all of the testing we could do. And things did improve. For the rest of the night um, and so forth, it seemed like IPAM was running smoothly and we weren't having any more incidents. I was officially off call and I handed off the pager to another team member. Unfortunately though, the next day we had another alert. What we found was that the issue, while it had improved a bit and at the moment, it repeated itself the next day. And you can kind of see that this, which is just a slice of one day, but this repeated itself for several days, is that we would have periods of spikes in errors and then go down, and then another spike, and then it would go down, and then spikes again. Sometimes the spikes would be a couple hours long, sometimes they wouldn't be, but the problem was that it was something that had, didn't happen before. This cyclical uh, high error rate was concerning, and it seemed to point that there were other issues that we hadn't solved yet. And so the team dug in and we decided to try and thoroughly go through the code base. And we actually found out that the issue was a combination of factors, which is always the case when you're handling a big system with many services talking to each other. So it turns out that um, every night in DigitalOcean, when it's the quiet hours of uh, our business, we don't have that many users trying to use our system. Um, there are several long running queries that are run on the database. These queries can be an auditing of accounts, collecting information for billing. It's basically these queries to gather information for important processes, but because they take so long to run and they look over so much information, they're run during the times when there's the fewest traffic from users. Um, because if users try to use our system while running these, then we could run into some performance issues. So that's what was going on at the night. And these queries putting a lot of load on our database. Now the issue though is that IPAM was getting requests to allocate a bunch of IPs 
just assign them to droplets. And when IPAM connects to the database during one of these long running queries, things start to fall apart. The basic idea is that the database couldn't complete our operations, our database operations fast enough because it was too busy handling these other queries that were taking so long and our operations would time out or basically just never get to finish. And the idea with IPAM in our uh, design was that we would retry our operation after a little bit of time. And if it fails again, we'll retry a third time, but just wait a little bit longer. So the whole idea is that we would just keep trying the database just a little bit longer before we tell the user, sorry, we couldn't do it. And here's kind of a picture of what that looks like. So we have IPAM on the left and the database on the right, and we have a request to allocate an IP to a droplet. We send that operation and we start a timer, a stopwatch. This is basically our timeout. The reason for this is that we don't want this operation to just hang and take forever. We're basically saying you have X amount of time to finish or we're gonna cancel you. Um, this is a pretty standard um, pattern in software uh, engineering just to make sure that you don't have just dangling things that don't finish. So we send an operation, it fails. Well, we would try again after some time. It fails again. We would try again. Oh, we succeed. And then we give a response. And then we tell the user, your droplet is, is done. Here's the IP. So this is the idea. We, we want to try and do this rich retry a few times because we don't want to fail once and have to go all the way back to the user and tell them try again. We want to just have a chance to retry a few times to succeed. Now, why is this an issue? Well, this is an issue because every time we try to allocate an IP, we connect to the database and update a row of data. And since we want to make, uh, and to make sure that while we're doing this, another operation doesn't come in and update the row we're working on, the database puts a lock on that row. And the idea of that is basically saying, hey, this IP is busy, it's being updated, it's being assigned, no one can touch this, you need to uh, wait. And so what this happens is that when you have a row being updated, but there's other operations coming in to work on the database, it forms a queue and you have these operations all lining up to be completed and they're all waiting until the update is done. And you can see what that looks like on the right here. We have a queue of operations. When one is ready to be done, it goes off the queue and any new ones go in the back just kind of like lining up at the supermarket or something. And so we end up having a queue of database operations that are waiting their turn. But remember that each one has a timeout. So it's kind of like a race. It's trying to get its operation done on the database, but there's a little timer saying, oh, you only have so much time left. And if we time out before finishing, we retry and then we go to the back of the queue. So you can kind of see that we have an issue where some things just don't get done. And so the solution that we came up with was essentially that we had to fix our retry logic. We were um, we do, we're doing something which is what we call an exponential retry. We retry after 100 milliseconds, and then we wait and we give it some time, we retry again, give it some time, we retry again, and we finally stop after 20 seconds. So if we go back here, you could say an operation comes in, it fails. Okay, we will wait 100 milliseconds. We'll retry again, fails. Okay, now we'll wait one second. Oh, fail, we'll retry after two seconds, and so on and so forth until either 20 seconds happens or we complete. Um, and so you can see that if you have this queue and you have something retrying, but it goes to the back, it's just not really ever getting done if the database is too busy. You just have a huge line and things just getting put on the back to retry. In the meantime, you also have new stuff coming in. So it's just too much going through and nothing's ever getting done. And the reason why this was an issue before was just that we weren't getting as much traffic before as usual. But now we've had some clients coming and joining DO and wanting to do a whole bunch of creates at one time. 
and it was just more than we could handle. Our retry logic wasn't working anymore. So what we had to do was we had to fix it and basically say, you get three times and then that's it. And they have to be pretty quick. We also found that some of the queries we used with our database were kind of creating some unnecessary locks. So basically, some of our queries were just very inefficient. They were telling the database to lock and to hold this data, not let anyone else touch it or work on it. But we didn't need to do that for every case. So by optimizing our queries, we were able to free up some of the work on the database to let other queries do some work. Next, we reordered the execution of our queries. And so when we have this allocation of IPs, we actually, in the logic, which I can't show the code base, but we have several queries in a row that are all need to be done to allocate a single IP address. It's kind of like we do these queries and each one is a special case. We kind of do a query to see if we can grab um, a certain IP and if it's not available, then we have to go search for an IP. And if that's not available, we do another query to go and really try and find a free IP in another area. We kind of do all these within one step of allocating an IP. Um, and this worked before, but now the previous order, this ordering of queries wasn't making sense anymore because since building IPAM and doing more work, more refactoring, um, new features, we actually found that this order wasn't efficient anymore. We actually could change the order. And so we went around and did some finagling, did some testing, and we reordered it so that it was more efficient and we could finish allocating an IP if just one or two of these queries finished. Um, it's a little hard to kind of visualize without looking at the code, but this was a really important thing. And it's something that you might see once you go to a bigger software system for your job where the everything kind of matters. The logic to retry with your database, the exact queries that you run, and also the ordering that they're executed. Every little bit is a factor, and sometimes you have to optimize a piece of it, and sometimes you have to optimize everything. And then lastly, one of the things we had to do was we had to improve our monitoring to get a clearer picture of the system. So before I showed you those graphs to get a sense of all of the requests and how long they were taking and their error rate, we found that we needed to do more. We needed to get a deeper, clearer picture of what things were going on with IPAM. And so we added some more um, monitoring, some more visuals so that at a glance we can see what's going on. This is using a tool called Kibana which we were able to configure with our code so that we could see uh, internally how every query to the database was working, see if there was any issues um, and so forth. Um, you can kind of see here on the left at the bottom that this graph basically just says all of the errors for uh, the operations we were sending to the database. So we can kind of see what was the issue and we can start tackling that issue. We have on the right here just a picture of the number of retries we were doing and so on. This is after our fixes when I told you we fixed our retry logic and you can see that most of the time we barely, uh, we do only six, sometimes 10 retries. This one has 16, but before we were getting way too many retries, upwards of 25 or 30 retries. It was just not a good idea. So we added more of this so that when anything starts to degrade, performance suffers, we could then easily have a look and see what's going on instead of having to just muddle through the code and try and guess. Um, this is another tool for monitoring a system called LightStep. And it's really cool because um, it's better if it's interactive. I could only grab a picture, um, but basically it will look at everything from the user sending a request and it getting completed by the database and back. So when you actually can interact with this, you can click on any of these lines and look deep into the operation that is part of the request and how it's doing and how long it's taking. So here on the bottom, you can see each of these operations in the system, not just IPAM from the API, Harpoon, um, Alpha, everything. 
and it'll tell you how long each little piece takes. So with that, you can clearly see, oh, this thing is taking one second, other things are taking microseconds. It gives you the chance to see what is the bottleneck so that you can address that. Um, so because if you don't know where the issue is, you can't effectively fix the issue. And uh, you need to be able to measure to see where you need to put your time into to fix things. So Lightstep was huge to kind of add and give us a clear picture of things. So all of that was the work that was gone into the incident. The incident took about a week and a half of mitigating and constantly testing and fixing and doing more refactoring of the code to fix things, to get everything resolved to that we were no longer getting paged. Um, and we actually spent an extra two weeks after that doing more work to help fix things and prevent this in the future. And I just wanna take a moment here to talk about how important teamwork and our blameless culture idea was to achieve this. So this was a high stress situation. It was involving all these clients trying to create droplets, which is something that we're looking for them to do so that we can get paid and they weren't able to do it. Um, and it's also impacts our reputation if we can't fix a situation quickly, nor um, can we actually uh, fix the system at all. Um, so it was a high stress situation, but there was no finger pointing. Um, several teams, Harpoon, IPAM, Data Platforms, which is the team that handles our databases, CloudOps, which is basically our 24-7 uh, support crew who monitor our systems and organize people to come in and get paged and to handle systems. They're great. We all rallied together, identified the issues, and implemented the fixes together. When you have a system as large as what we have at DO, it's not just one person saving the day. That really doesn't happen. It's the combined effort of everyone. Um, and even though it was an issue with IPAM, no one said, hey, the IPAM team was terrible or their code sucks. Everyone just bonded together to get it fixed. Once the incident was resolved, um, we actually wrote an internal post-mortem review, which detailed what happened, why it happened, how it was resolved, and what can be done in the future to avoid a similar situation. So the author of this is usually a member of the team that identified and resolved the issue. And that was actually me, along with a couple of teammates. Um, and so all of these post-mortem reviews are collected and stored um, internally at DO so that we can look back on them and try to improve and also identify um, what was pain points that we need to spend time on in the future. And the ultimate um, thing about all of this is that software is really hard at times and no one can predict every incident that could occur. But if an incident occurs, it's regarded at DO as a process issue. It's not any one person who was malicious or uh, didn't know what to do. It was really a result of insufficient code review. So two mates not giving code review the time of day that should not happen. They should thoroughly look at everyone's code. Um, there's some engineering practices that could be improved. Um, big point is that reliability work wasn't prioritized alongside new features. And what I mean by that is that it's exciting and fun to implement new stuff that customers use and everything. But if you don't take time to actually refactor your software and consider how to make it reliable under a lot of users, um, odd situations, the situation where you have other queries affecting the database. If you don't take time to consider that as well, then you're gonna have situations like these. And that was in the case of our retry logic. It was something that we had neglected that was actually needed to be updated as we went along. And finally, there's the lack of documentation is an issue. And as I had mentioned, this isolation issue that Harpoon pointed out um, regarding the database, that was something that actually happened almost a year and a half ago um, on a previous system. And they did a similar thing to fix it, but that was never documented. And it was never conveyed to other teams, hey, this is something you should watch out for. If it had been, this may never have actually precipitated in some way. We would still have the retry logic to fix, but we could have maybe had a less severe incident if we had known about this before. So once again, it's a process issue that we should all learn from. And so the takeaways from this experience for me and I, I wanna share is distributed, distributed systems in general are very hard. There's lots of services talking to each other. It's hard to kind of tell where something went wrong. 
but good monitoring, good tools to see what's going on makes it so much better. Um, test your code fixes and your patches before you deploy, even under high stress situations. If you don't, you can introduce a new bug and it just causes things to go even worse. Yes, you're under pressure to get something fixed, but that doesn't mean that you should neglect um, good practices um, and just plain old good engineering. Uh, when transitioning code and responsibilities or you know, situations like the isolation issue, be sure to document it and share it with others. Someone else may benefit from it. Solving incidents is a team matter and requires cooperation from many engineers. Um, when you're working on big systems, ensure that you're building for reliability, maintainability, and monitoring, not just new features. So that, like I said, goes for can your system handle an increase in users? Um, uh, can it handle increased uh, load on the database? Um, is it still easy to read? Is it still easy to work with? Um, how well can you see how everything is operating? These are things to consider, not just what's the shiny new thing we can build. Advocate for a blameless culture and always learn from the incidents. And lastly, just you know, common knowledge now, looking back, you're never gonna avoid every bad scenario or late night page, but good engineering practices and improvements can decrease their likelihood. So long as you're continually looking back, reflecting and improving the system, over time, hopefully, these kinds of situations should happen less and less frequently. And that's my presentation. Thanks so much for listening and for uh, hearing me ramble about this. This is a first cut of the presentation and I'm going to be giving it as a conference talk uh, in about a month. So um, please give, any, give me any feedback you would like, either here or in a Slack DM, I'd really appreciate it. And now I'm open for questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. We have a QA and a uh, question. Uh, Mike Del Rio, before arriving at the query and queue uh, TT optimizations, were there any discussions about scaling the queue? Um, there so the question is with scaling the queue. Um, that wasn't really into a discussion because at the end of the day, um, while that could have helped kind of the symptom of the issue, the root cause of it was our retry logic and um, also our, the organization of the queries. Um, the queue is another thing that maybe down the road we should improve, but at the end of the day, um, these were some real code issues that need to be resolved if we want to keep scaling with more users. Um, so there was some discussion about it, but we decided ultimately that the query and the queue optimizations were more impactful and prior, should be prioritized. Um, plus, uh, some of the queues that are used at DO are, spe are specifically with some other teams. And we wanted to kind of, um, we don't actually IPAM as the team directly manage the queue. So that was something that we didn't have direct control over. Um, also, another question. Also, with many IPs in the same machine, are they each handling requests on unique ports? Uh, generally, um, there is a unique port that each uh, virtual machine could listen to, um, if I recall correctly. Um, so that is the case. Um, I might have to refresh my memory on that. But to my understanding, each VM could listen to a unique port. Uh, we have another question. Um, is there a separate production team that figures out the issue and pages you guys? Um, so generally, yes, that's the team CloudOps. So CloudOps is a group of um, engineers who have shifts that go on for eight or 10 hours. And the team basically has someone around the clock um, always observing the system. And they have their own services and um, their own tooling to let them know of any issues that come up so that they can quickly kind of see any beginning signs of an issue and they can monitor and if it becomes worse, they can make a judgment call and say, okay, we have to page this person. Um, and so they're the main people who have that responsibility. Um, however, every service at DigitalOcean also is designed to have its own alerting. So basically with IPAM, 
we have some code that basically looks at the error rate of requests or the latency of a request. And if it reaches a certain level, it'll automatically send a page out to whoever is on call for the team. So sometimes cloud ops gets to page us if they see something or if they determine this, our service is the issue, but each service by itself has some code that will check um, life signs, life signals, and say there's an issue here and it'll automatically page the on-call person. Uh, the next question is, also, do you have access to prod to debug issues like this? Um, so not quite like that's kind of, I'd like a little more info on that, but basically um, at DO we have a staging um, area and we have a prod area. Um, and we have uh, all of that monitoring, Grafana, Kibana, Lightstep, all of that has, uh, is set for both. So typically what happens is that when we are writing new code, we put it on the staging area. We look to see if there's any issues, if everything looks good, we then push it to production. And we still have our own Grafana, Kibana, Lightstep monitoring tools and look at production too. So that's all there. Um, and uh, that's what's going on. There are some other techniques for debugging a prod. It usually involves somebody maybe SSH into a droplet to see what's going on with some debugging tools. Um, but that's not the case for every team. Usually um, in the case of like a code change like IPAM, we'll identify, we'll fix a patch, we'll test, we'll use staging to verify, and then we'll push it to production. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, question from John. This might be specific to your use case, but how long do you typically wait for a query to complete before cancel it, canceling it and scheduling the query? Does this number also increase like your timeout does? Um, so the, the timing for a timeout to wait for a query to complete is kind of dependent on the service and what you expect. Um, once you get into these bigger organizations, you have something called SLAs and SLOs, which is basically um, an abbreviation for service level agreement. Um, and what that basically means is that as a service, we're going to promise to complete every request within, I don't know, five seconds or less or something. And that's a, an agreement that service makes with the rest of the system. And that's the quality, the, the bar that they set. Um, so in order to achieve that, that can help determine how long of a timeout they set for these connections to the database and such. Um, so it's part of that. Um, sometimes it's also just a case of, okay, let's just do a bunch of testing. Let's throw as many requests as we want at the service. Let's um, do this and let's just see how the thing performs. And then you can kind of estimate and tweak from there what the timeout looks best for you. So it's kind of like two angles you can go at it. You can do extensive experimentation and testing and then kind of determine from there, or you can have, this is what we want to achieve. And then you set out by, to achieve it by kind of figuring out the timeout uh, metric for that. Uh, does this number also increase like your timeout does? Um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. I mean, it can, um, but like I said, it really does depend on what the scenario is for each team. Um, I have to think a little bit more on that one. The next question we have is from Carl. Uh, you said it took about a week and a half to fix the issue. I assume the service wasn't down the whole time. What is that process like? Right, so the service wasn't down the whole time. Um, so it was still operating. It was just in a degraded state with some periods of time where it just was giving 100% error rates. Um, but we had some other th mitigations we could do to kind of ease up on the situation. So sometimes if it's the case like this incident where the database is just trying to do too much and can't handle it, the data platforms team can just preemptively and the queries that are long running. So those long running queries for billing and auditing that was putting too much stress in the database, they can say, oh, okay, let's just end it. And once they ended it, then uh, the then everything kind of like fixes itself for a little bit. It's not the best situation, but it um, it's kind of like something we can do in the meantime. Uh, let me just quickly check this. Okay, so that's one of the mitigations. It's not ideal because the billing queries and audit queries are something that we want to run, but 
we need to also kind of make the situation a little better in the moment. So that's one thing. Um, also, we had some internal services um, doing a lot of testing um, in production, and those things put more load on the system as well. And so we had to turn some of that off as well to uh, help IPAM, you know, get into a better state. So there's some tweaking that we could do in that week and a half to kind of make it better. Um, and that's what we did. And then once we were able to put the patch through and fix the issue, we slowly turned all of that testing and production and all of those um, other things back on and then sort of allowing those long-term queries to run again. And we saw that IPAM held up after that. So it is kind of like a gradual process to bring everything back even keel. Um, that's kind of the idea for that. Owen um, asks, when you get paged at 4 a.m., are there situations where other members of the team who aren't on call get pulled in to help, or is it just the on-call person addressing the problem by themselves until regular working hours? So basically, um, yes, when you get called, paged in, you do try and assess the situation and see what you can help fix um, by yourself. Um, but sometimes you will just realize, hey, I don't have the knowledge to fix this, or this is something I'm not used, I'm not aware of how to do, and you were able to page someone else in. So in my situation, you know, I was able to help diagnose things for a couple hours, but then once um, I realized, oh, we have to change this isolation level, I don't know much about that or its ramifications, I'm going to page in a team member. And that's not regarded as a bad thing. Everyone wants to make sure the system is functional. And you know, if the incident were to occur in the middle of the workday, most likely all of my teammates would jump in just to see if they can help anyway, even if they're not on call. Um, so that's the kind of atmosphere here at DO. Um, and it's generally regarded that if you realize that you are not the best equipped to handle that situation, you're totally given the okay to page someone else in, um, even if they're not on call and have them help you. Um, so it's really kind of an understanding with that. All right, next question is from Stephanie. Is there any fear that the overall system becomes so complex that the problem actually can't be solved in a reasonable amount of time? Um, that's a good question. Um, that is a real fear. Um, the system like can get very complex with a lot of moving parts um, that uh, is not possible for one person to be able to understand everything. There are parts of the DO software system that I have no idea works and I would not be able to help solve that area, um, for instance. Um, I think a big thing that helps with that is having the separation of duties. So you have people who are very specialized on each part of the system that can come in and help. You have the overall cloud ops team to kind of monitor everything and um, they're really, really good at debugging and also having some short term measures to help fix things for the short term until the actual fix happens. And a lot of the times is also um, making sure you have enough monitoring to watch everything and get a sense of how things work internally. Um, by the end of the day, um, you know, when it comes to reasonable amount of time, it kind of really does involve a lot of communication. Um, you know, you, we could say, hey, this is probably not a big issue, could take a data fix, and then we discover, oh, actually, it's a really big issue, it takes more time, um, and we just have to deal with it. Um, uh, the only point where it gets into where it can't be solved in a reasonable amount of time is where if it's a major issue like if we were not able to temporarily allow people to create droplets again, we would have to post on the status page on our website, hey, we're having issues right now, uh, please give us some time. And we would have to uh, do a public statement of like what happened and how we fixed it. And we would also, um, so in some cases, give credits to users whose accounts were affected. So um, the system can get pretty complex at times. It's not something that any one person can know everything about. Um, but there are ways to mitigate that through good monitoring, good practices, um, everyone helping. Um, and I think that as long as that's in place, um, and as long as everyone makes an effort in their regular day to day to improve the system, make it more readable, make it more understandable, um, you can avoid that. But it definitely takes a lot of care and teamwork. 
Uh, next question from Ian. Any discussion of running these heavy nightly queries on a separate data store from what the IPAM APIs are reading and writing to a separate replica or maybe a data warehouse? Um, that's a good question. Um, there likely has been some conversations and there have been um, some of those improvements that have been made. So a couple of those long running queries when they were first created, um, they were back when DO was much smaller and they were just given the access to operate on the, uh, the write replica of our database. So we have uh, read and write replicas. We have one database where um, you write data to and then several others that you can read data from uh, just to kind of separate out all the requests and for basically because I guess no one went back to consider and change it some of these long queries were running on the database for writing data when they didn't need to be they could be on a replica that only needs to read data and that helped out a lot so there's actually um, a couple queries that were moved over to the read replicas and that helped uh, performance quite a bit. So some of that did happen. Um, um, as far as I know, we don't have too much of some other kind of data warehouse. Um, I don't know if that's been discussed or any plans for that, but pretty much all we have is the alpha database and its replicas. Um, so yeah, but definitely something that we look back on and other teams are trying to improve. Another question, can you go into more detail on how you load test? There's some automated testing that simulates more requests. Yes, um, so what we have is um, a bunch of uh, automated testing that is done with scripts. So you write it out, it's scripted to um, uh, grab data from the database, perform some operations, and go through the whole step-by-step -step process um, that happens um, like a user would, like a user creates a droplet, where well, we have a script that simulates that. It does the request, it allocates um, the IP for that droplet, it goes back, it gives the response, it goes through other steps. That's all automated through several test files that we just click a button and we can run and we can even tune it with how many requests we wanna send, how long we wanna be, doing this test and so forth. So it is automated um, and that's something that is even a specialty of some software engineers. Some software engineers specialize on getting really, really good at automated testing, different strategies of testing. And we have someone like that on the IPAM team. So that is kind of how it is. It's a script that um, will simulate that whole process and you can then tune it to how many requests you wanna do it once, how long you wanna do it and so forth. Um, question from Derek. Uh, this sounds like an exceptionally challenging situation to resolve. How did it differ from a more typical challenge? Does a long-term fix usually take 10 days to implement? Um, I would say this is kind of outside the norm. A lot of incidents that could occur at DO could be fixed anywhere from within a few hours to half a day, um, but this was an excessively long one. Um, we, the, the typical incidents at DO um, can be for everything from changes in the code that were suboptimal to, um, you know, something that slipped through code review and so forth. So um, I would say that for us to have this long running issue for 10 days, um, it was significantly different. Um, and we have levels of severity with every situation. So at DO, we have uh, everything from a SEV5 all the way to a SEV1, SEV1, no, sorry, SEV0, SEV0 being the worst. And this incident with IPAM was a SEV1. So it was the second highest level, um, which was uh, pretty high pressure. Um, and uh, a part of it though that it took so long was just because we did the first patch, we did some testing with it that took some time, that was fixed. And then we identified more issues that we had to go in and test and fix. And that took time. Um, and then even after that, we wanted to do some more work, like adding more monitoring and things before we were able to say, okay, everything is totally fine. We can say that this incident is resolved. So part of it was our own due diligence to say that everything is good to go before we officially call it resolved. Um, and I hope that answers your question. A uh, question from Jerry, are there plans of adding more team service and specialization as your user base grows? Um, uh, I'm not too quite sure about specializations. I don't know if you're referring to products or uh, specializations of basically engineers and their backgrounds, but um, 
we right now we probably are um, looking to improve our services. Um, I wouldn't say that we're looking to add a ton of services, but more to take some time to really fix any um, unoptimized code to improve our reliability and maintainability, kind of fix our technical debt um, in that way. Um, we do have some new members joining some team in the next few months, um, though I don't know all the details about that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't really know all the inner workings about all of that. Um, all I know is that the main focus right now is that we want to take a step back and fix some of the gaping holes um, in some of our services and also to um, really kind of look at all the data from our monitoring and see what needs to be fixed. Um, but uh, yeah, um, the, the one major thing that we want to do with IPAM though is in the next year and a half is that we want to really make it even more distributed. So one of the issues is that, you know, IPAM had our, its own problems, but we were also speaking to the same database that every other service was talking to. When you have every service talking to the same database, the database at some time is going to be overloaded. It just can't handle everything. So a long-term thing that we want to do at DO is we want to um, give services its own database. So, you know, IPAM cares about IP addresses. It doesn't really care about other things. It doesn't care about load balancers, which is another product we have. It doesn't care about database, uh, managed databases, which is another product we have. Um, IPAM only cares about IP addresses assigned to droplets. So the goal would be for us to move that data that we work on outside of Alpha, our main database, and put it in a smaller database that only IPAM cares about. And the advantage of that is that then the only service talking to that database is IPAM, and we're the only ones who can mess with it. So we don't have to worry about other queries coming in and affecting our performance. Um, it's really just us. Um, that's something that would help enormously, and that's something that is in the long-term prospects that we're considering. But it definitely is going to require a lot of work and some more um, just scoping out what that's going to look like. But I would say that's the the most clear objective we're going to have. Um, but I think I answered all the questions, um, but if there's any more questions, feel free to drop them. I'll hang around for a few more minutes. I don't see anything in the chat. If anyone didn't felt like I didn't answer enough of their question, they can also put another one. Oh, okay. Um, actually, looking back, I don't know, John, if you're still on the uh, on the Tech and Talk, but I'm rereading your question about um, waiting for a query to complete before canceling it and scheduling the retry, and asking if this number also increases like your timeout does. Um, so let me kind of um, clarify a little bit. Um, so generally, the timeout is longer than the time it takes to do all the retries. So if I have a code set up to do an operation, retry after 10 milliseconds, retry after a second, retry after 10 seconds, the timeout will actually be long enough to allow all of those to happen. Um, so the timeout is just really taking that into account because all those retries are expected behavior for that operation. If for some reason the um, the, the operation were to last longer than all that time allowed for the retries, that's where the timeout actually matters because the timeout is basically there to say, oh, we have a dangling connection. For some reason, this connection can't connect to the database. Like it's really there just to clean up anything that just hasn't done its job so that we can free up database connections for other operations. Um, so the timeout is long enough to handle every single uh, retry. Um, and we kind of had to tweak that as well. 
Cool, I'm glad I answered it. Okay, well, I don't see any other new questions, but I thank you everyone for coming um, and listening. Um, like I said, um, I would really appreciate any further feedback. If there's any part that I went over too quickly, not clearly enough, or you think could use a better diagram, please feel free to um, post in general or DM me, and I would really appreciate that. Other than that, thanks for coming out, and have a good night.